Hi everyone, I'm Silas Chapman from Pathways of the Past, and this is Let's Talk Archaeology. Today's topic of discussion is the Seleucian Hypothesis. So what is the Seleucian Hypothesis? Well, this is an idea that was put forth by archaeologists Bruce Bradley and Dennis Stanford. They notice an overlap in the flint napping technique of overshot flaking in both Seleucian and Clovis assemblages. The Seleucians are a Paleolithic hunter-gatherer group that lived from 23,000 to 18,000 years before present in what is now Spain and France. The Clovis culture dates to around 13,000 years ago and is one of the oldest recognized cultures in North America. Because of this overlap in flint napping techniques, Stanford and Bradley hypothesized that Seleucians may have migrated during the Ice Age to North America where they became the Clovis people, or at least influenced them to some degree. They proposed that the Seleucians made this journey from the Iberian Peninsula in southern France, 6,000 kilometers across the frozen Atlantic Ocean, into North America on the east coast. Because of the gap between the dates of Seleucian and Clovis peoples, Stanford and Bradley proposed that rather than founding the Clovis peoples in North America, the Seleucians founded the pre-Clovis peoples in North America. The discipline of archaeology, for the most part, disregards this hypothesis. However, it's kind of taken root in mainstream culture and media. In this video, I'm going to explain why the Seleucian hypothesis isn't a very good hypothesis along three lines of evidence. I'm going to discuss the lithic technology in archaeology, I'm going to discuss the geographical and climatic evidence, and I'm also going to discuss the genetic evidence. One thing I want to clarify is that this video is not an attack on the lives or work of Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley. I'm merely just critiquing their hypothesis and talking about the evidence against it. If you want to see what they have to say on the Seleucian Hypothesis, I'd recommend that you check out their book titled Across Atlantic Ice, The Origins of America's Clovis Culture. So what is the lithic evidence, the evidence with stone tools, that supports or confirms the Seleucian Hypothesis. Well, Stanford and Bradley's idea is that overshot flaking, is, which is found in both Clovis and Seleucian assemblages, is the connecting thing between the two cultures. Overshot flaking happens when you strike a biface on one edge, a flake travels across the face of the piece and removes a portion of the opposite edge. Stanford and Bradley claim that this technique is incredibly efficient at thinning a biface, more so than just normal thinning. This technique is difficult to control and master, which is why that Stanford and Bradley think that rather than being invented twice separately, that this was invented once, and is evidence that the Seleucians influenced the Clovis peoples, or at least the pre-Clovis peoples. However, unlike what the Seleucian hypothesis claims, Overshot flaking may not really be that special. An experimental study that involved both Bob Patton and Met and Aaron, who are both extremely accomplished flint nappers and archaeologists, proves that overshot flaking isn't as great as the Seleucian hypothesis claims it is. These two flint nappers made 39 bifaces, in which they tried to produce as many overshot flakes as possible. Over 650 thinning flakes were produced in making these bifaces and just over 100 were overshot flakes. During the production of these bifaces, they measured the width to thickness ratio of the biface before and after the flake was removed. And what they found is that overshot flakes aren't really more efficient at thinning a biface than normal flakes. The same study examines the debitage of Clovis sites and comes to the conclusion that overshot flakes aren't actually that common in Clovis assemblages. What these researchers think is that Seleucians and Clovis peoples use thinning techniques that both happen to produce similar amounts of overshot flakes, but that these techniques were invented independently rather than one stemming from the other. Now, as I mentioned previously, the revised Seleucian hypothesis thinks that Seleucians influenced the pre-Clovis peoples, not directly the Clovis peoples who came thereafter. Stanford and Bradley cite 14 pre-Clovis sites in their book, and claim that these are evidence for their hypothesis. However, in these 14 assemblages, there's only one overshot flake found. 14 sites, 14 different assemblages, only one overshot flake. 
not a very good argument for a Salutrine and Clovis and pre-Clovis connection. So Stanford and Bradley claim that there's some direct evidence that supports the Salutrine hypothesis, some evidence in the form of archaeological sites and artifacts. One of these is pictured right on the cover of Across Atlantic Ice and is a rhyolite biface that is bipointed and somewhat Salutrian-like. This biface was dredged up off the Virginia coast along with some mastodon bone and tusk. The collagen in this tusk was dated to around 22,000 years ago. Stanford and Bradley claim that these bones and this biface are associated. However, dredges like this dredge up a part of the ocean bottom that's about 4 meters wide and dredge along a 1 to 9 kilometer area, claiming any sort of association between this artifact and these bones is not a good argument, especially for archaeology. This biface also happens to resemble some sort of stone tools that come later in North America's prehistory of this Atlantic coastal region. They also claim that Miles Point and Oyster Cove archaeological sites are evidence of a pre-Clovis Salutrian light occupation along the east coast. However, these two archaeological sites have some problems with them. The first problem is that these artifacts come from disturbed or highly questionable contexts where they were found. The second is that the dates for these sites are inconsistent with their own hypothesis and they're also from questionable areas within the sites and aren't really good evidence. The final bit of archaeological and lithic evidence against the Salutrian hypothesis is the lack of overlap between Clovis and Salutrian assemblages. While there is the supposed overlap in overshot flaking, the finished bifaces of these two traditions don't really resemble each other closely. There's also a lack of other overlap in material culture and what we find in the archaeological record. So does the climatic evidence suggest that it was possible for Seleucians to make it into North America across the North Atlantic? The Seleucian hypothesis claims that the North Atlantic was frozen over in a single continuous coast that would have provided a source of food, such as marine mammals and seals, and fresh water for the Seleucians boating across the North Atlantic. However, studies have shown that this probably wasn't the case. Climatic data shows that the North Atlantic was only frozen over for about one to two months a year, which isn't very good for the Salutrians. The ecology of this ice sheet may not have been very rich or diverse, which means there wouldn't have been a whole lot for these Salutrians to eat. There also isn't really evidence supporting that this was a very habitable ice sheet. This was probably a very harsh environment, and the ice was probably broken up into large chunks or icebergs that weren't very good for people who are trying to subsist in this area. There isn't any evidence that Salutrians, pre-Clovis, or Clovis peoples were adapted to this environment or ecology. So what genetic evidence is there for or against the Salutrian hypothesis? Studies have shown that all indigenous populations from both North and South America belong to one of five haplogroups. These haplogroups are named A2, B2, C1, D1, and X2A. All of these haplogroups are shown to be extremely similar and most resemble the genetics of populations in Northeast Asia, where most archaeologists think that the ancestors of the Native Americans came from. Stanford and Bradley have claimed that the X2A haplogroup is evidence for the Salutrian hypothesis, since it doesn't really have an origin in Northeast Asia. However, this doesn't really support the Salutrian hypothesis because geneticists don't really know the origins of the X2A haplogroup. While there is an X haplogroup in Europe, this haplogroup is only very distantly related to the X2A haplogroup. The oldest known person to have the X2A haplogroup gene is the Kennewick Man, a roughly 9,000 year old skeleton discovered in Western North America. When Kennewick Man's genetic sequence was looked at, it bore no resemblance to that of European populations. Genetics can't really be used to support the Salutrine hypothesis, as Salutrine DNA has never been sequenced. The modern European gene pool can't really be used to support the Salutrian hypothesis, as this genetic pool is only about 8,000 years old. All genetic evidence suggests that the first Americans came out of Northeast Asia as one single founding population. If the Salutrians did make it to North America, you think that they would have left their genetic imprint in some way. 
Overall, the genetic evidence is one of the strongest cases against the salutrine hypothesis. So in conclusion, there isn't good scientific evidence for the salutrine hypothesis. All archaeological, climatic, and genetic data suggest that the salutrine hypothesis is not accurate. If you want to see me do more videos like this, or have topics for me to discuss, let me know in the comment section. I'm Silas Chapman with Pathways of the Past, and I'll see you guys next time.